That took an inordinately long time for Google Hangouts to kick on. Hey, everybody, some gadget guy here. It's Friday, and uh, we've got another slate of really awesome viewer comments and questions to go through. It's a time for another episode of SGG QA. So this is becoming uh, one of my favorite things. I'm really looking forward to these at the end of the week because when I'm fielding 150, 200 comments a day on some of my videos, it's uh, you know I get some really great discussions discussions going on. I get some really snarky comments coming from you guys. It's it's uh, it's a lot of fun kind of keeping up with all that, even though it is a part time job all into itself. We're gonna jump right into some housekeeping. Uh, I've got to get my notes over here, my show notes. I'm going to lead with this because it's it's going to be a big deal coming up. We're getting to the end of July and the beginning of August. August is my birth month. And uh, instead of uh, expecting you guys to send me all kinds of presents, I have a ton of gear that I'm going to be giving away on this channel. It's going to be a, a lot of fun. Entire week of giveaways that we've got planned. Just uh, showing you guys some of the things we've got coming down the pipe. This is the stylus metal camera case for the iPhone 6. did a full review on this. This thing is baller. It's a super high quality camera. Uh, metal bump bumper case that then has a camera attachment which has these little lenses that swivel out so that they uh, they clip in front of the iPhone camera. You can do things like amazing macro shots, super wide angle photography. They even have a circular polarizer. I mean, it's really cool, really top notch stuff. It's a great way to augment your photography on uh, iOS devices. So iPhone users and be showing you guys a little love. My pals at LG uh, have hooked me up with a bunch of these VR viewers for the G3. It's like a really high quality plastic version of Google Cardboard so that you can start interacting with VR just for the G3. I've got one that's all put together right here. As you can see, it's just this cool little viewer and the phone mounts into the back of it. You kind of put it on your face, Jordi LaForge style, and you are experiencing a reality which is virtual from the one that you currently reside in. Super cool. It's a lot of fun. And uh, I'm going to throw another shout out. I mentioned uh, this app last week um, in last week's SGGQA, but I want to throw another shout out to the It Can Wait campaign because they've released a really great uh, video demo. It's not really an app. It's really more an immersive video. But it's a, it, it's sort of a, a great learning tool for sort of exposing, especially for kids, what the uh, the consequences of distracted driving might be. And so it's you're following someone who's trying to drive a, a car while interacting with their smartphone and just everything that kind of happens to them while they're blowing through intersections or almost getting into rear-end collisions. And so I, if you check out the, uh, the It Can Wait VR app, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but if you search Google Play, you'll be able to find it. Um, I, it's, it's a great learning resource. Definitely check out the It Can Wait campaign. Distracted driving is a really terrible nuisance on our society, and it's up to us geeks to do something about it because everyday folk who aren't as tech savvy are very easily swayed by this kind of stuff. But um, long story incredibly, or short story incredibly long. LG, super cool of them to hook up these VR viewers. And if you don't have a G3, because this is only compatible with the LG G3, I am going to be giving away a new inbox unlocked LG G3 so you could own your very own G3. Definitely be on the lookout for that. Also, my, uh, my pals at AT&T are showing HTC some love for my birthday, and we're going to be giving away a brand new HTC One M9, brand spanking new phone. Uh, you can do whatever you want to do to it or with it, um, or you just use it as a smartphone. I don't know why I said that like that. That was kind of awkward and sort of weird. And at the end of this uh, week's SGGQA, we had a contest last week uh, using the call to action question at the end of last week's episode, and uh, we have I've already picked a winner, so we have a winner I'll be announcing at the end of this episode. Uh, one lucky viewer of this uh, of this fine video blog is this a vlog? Is this a podcast? Uh, it's a vlog. I don't know. Um, is going to be walking away with their own Lugu Lake speaker dock for tablets and smartphones. It's a killer Bluetooth speaker. You can use it as a stand for your tablets and laptops and uh, tablets and smartphones. And uh, one one lucky viewer is going to be getting that in the mail from yours truly. Totes exciting, so you definitely want to be on the lookout for that, especially if you participated last week. Uh, this is uh, this is when we're going to be announcing the winner for this week. That's all the contest stuff. Tons of contest stuff. Uh, let's see. I've got some other just personal news. I'm a big fan of the Toast Real Wood Covers, the, the folks at Toast. They're a quirky company up in Portland, Oregon, and uh, I'm a really big fan of their company, uh, these real wood skins for smartphones and tablets like the Surface. They even have like a MacBook cover. It's all real wood. It's very organic. And uh, it's a great experience in the hand. And I've been reviewing their, their stuff for a while now. They finally have a toast cover for the LG G4. So you can add wood paneling 
to your G4 to skin. It doesn't work with the leather back, but if you also have the plastic back, then you can add a really cool wood panel experience, and uh, I, I think it looks really cool. So I just shot a full review on assembling this and what it looks like when it's all fully covered with wood paneling, and I uh, just want to throw a shout out to the folks at Toast. I think they're a really cool group of people. Everything is manufactured here in the United States. It's all locally sourced, and they um, they power their facility using green energy. So I mean, they're just like a really uh, you know Portlandia kind of company, and they're a group of people that I love supporting, and it's a really unique product for a number of our smartphones out there. There are tons of skins and tons of wraps, but there's only one toast. Those guys are pretty cool. Uh, we also have this week... Oh, i got to talk about holidays. I almost forgot holidays. So today is Cousins Day. If you have a cousin, uh, shoot him a text, shoot him an email, shoot him a Facebook message. Just say, hey, happy Cousins Day. Uh, I don't think you need to get a card because we don't want to overly commercialize Cousins Day. We want to keep it chill and authentic and real <laughs> for Cousins Day. Now, you could celebrate, if you live near your cousin, you could celebrate Cousins Day by also taking them out for burger and fries because today is also National drive Through Day. So go to your favorite spot with the drive through and maybe say hey to the person working the drive through because I bet those people, those workers, those employees don't realize that today should be a day celebrating their work in the trenches, in the drive throughs across this great land. Uh, today is also National Tequila Day. And I would not recommend celebrating National Tequila Day before you get into an automobile to celebrate National drive Through Day. I think we would all agree that's a terrible idea. So there are examples of different ideas. That is an example of a terrible idea. And uh, today is also <laughs> Amelia Earhart Day. And maybe Amelia Earhart is lost because she celebrated National Tequila Day. Who knows? Um, but Amelia Earhart, uh, an amazing adventurer, uh, an inspiration to pilots and women and uh, people who want to push the boundaries on things that people say can't be done and just an, an amazing figurehead for that. Uh, unfortunately, Amelia Earhart, Earhart Day also celebrates a day with National Tell-A-Joke Day. So I'm not going to tell an, an Amelia Earhart joke because I think that would be tacky. Uh, so this was my favorite joke when I was a little kid. Was, my parents and I raised me to have a pretty warped sense of humor. So I was a little, little kid, and my absolute favorite joke uh, for years was, uh, was this one. I'm going to tell you this joke. It's, it's a terrible joke. So uh, what's big, green, fuzzy, has four legs, and if it fell out of a tree and landed on you, it would kill you? Well, a pool table, obviously. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> and I, that would just crack me up as a kid. I just loved those sort of absurd jokes, you know, like uh, why'd, the little, why'd the little boy fall out of the swing because he had no arms. You know, stuff like that used to crack me up as a little kid. So uh, for National Tell-A-Joke Day, uh, if you don't tell a joke to your cousin while going to celebrate National drive Through Day and then go home with your food from the drive through to celebrate National Tequila Day, drop me a comment down below with your favorite bad joke. And... Uh, Maybe I'll scrounge up something from one of these cabinets or one of these bookshelves, just random junk that I can give away as a prize. Who knows? It could happen. I don't have a giveaway lined up this week, but I've got tons of stuff to give away, so maybe I'll find something randomly. But enough on the housekeeping. Uh, we've got to get into the actual questions. Last week, from uh, the comments on last week's SGG QA, uh, we got a couple comments that I wanted to touch on. First one is uh, about the LG G4. This comes from Brady. He asks, have you experienced any lag on the LG G4? And the answer to that is, of course. I, it, this is one of the, the, the most difficult concepts, I think, to start expressing when it comes to modern-day high-end Premier smartphones. Every computing device, it doesn't matter how powerful, it doesn't matter how well-optimized, it, do, it, it, mean, it doesn't matter whatever the circumstances are. Every single computing device will lag at some point. You can make the G4 stutter. You can make the G4 hiccup. You can make the G4 perform unexpectedly poorly, uh, given how well this phone is put together. When we start talking about concepts like lag, when we start talking about stutters, and when we start talking about jank, everyone's going to have 
a very different threshold for what they consider to be acceptable performance or smooth performance or lag-free performance. And, and seriously, go to really well-established forums. Go to XDA developers, and you'll be able to look up your favorite phone. You, you, you think it's a phone that runs buttery smooth, and you'll I guarantee you'll find forum posts from people talking about how this is the laggiest phone they've ever used. And also, our perception on performance changes very quickly as new generations of devices come out, software support starts to get a, le a little lean on older devices. When a more powerful phone comes out, apps get bigger and more bloated and less optimized because the phone's horsepower can just kind of naturally over compensate for poor design. We really have some issues in this portable electronics, this mobile computing uh, environment we need to work on, but it's sort of toxic to the discussion. It's sort of counterproductive to sit there and try and decide on lag. Because we also have just issues with like someone's G one G4 might perform better or faster or smoother than another G4. You know, even with the best quality assurance and the best quality control, it doesn't mean that we're always going to land perfectly built devices with perfect examples of processors and RAM and storage. There's a lot of moving parts going on. Well, not moving parts, but there's a lot of stuff going on when all these things have to be pieced together. So it's one of the things why I try and stay away from discussions like, oh, this is so laggy and janky. I think one of the only devices where I've made that a big talking point in the, the review coverage that I've been trying to provide is the Galaxy S6. And we're actually going to get to that because there's another video that I produced and I got a lot of comments on um, that uh, we're going to talk about in just a little bit. So uh, another question from last week's uh, SGG QA. I'm considering purchasing an ASUS ZenWatch and I'm wondering how well Android, Android Wear ages. We've only really seen it slow down on the Moto 360 but on the older OMAP processor, that's to be expected. I'm curious on your thoughts about the newer generation of Wear Watches we'll be seeing soon and what type of software and hardware evolution might take place. Now, smartwatches, I don't think any company's figured them out. I think uh, Google is on a good track for integration with services like Google Now. I don't know that they've really solved the problems of smartwatches. In fact, I think their implementation of design and software can kind of exacerbate the companion device for your phone. Uh, it, it exacerbates some of the problems with having a companion device. Things like needing to charge it in 20 hours. You know, if you've got an Asus ZenWatch, I love the ZenWatch. Uh, I think it's one of the, the prettiest looking smartwatches out on the market. I think they beat Apple to the punch, and I think they beat Apple at their own game largely. Uh, some people get cranky about the bezel, but I, I think it's a great looking watch. I also love my LG G Watch R. These, these are great smartwatches, but it still bugs the pee out of me that it's kind of expected if I put it on in the morning, I won't be able to go to sleep that night and still have the watch functioning by the time I wake up again in the next morning. Like I can't really go a full 24 hours and then still have a functional watch. Um, and uh, that's also what we're going to be talking about next is I finally re uh, released my review on the Pebble Time. It's a very different experience where it's not as flashy, it's not as, it's not as pretty, it's not as upscale a device, but it's a better lifestyle device. You can run it for five days and actually use it for five full days. Um, and not have to worry about running for a charger. When you do charge it, the battery is half the size of a Wear watch. So you can also make it smaller. This is a much better smartwatch for people who, for men who like to wear their watches on the inside of their wrist, and for women, this watch is going to fit wrists much, much better, um, especially for the tinier, daintier members of the tech community, uh, where the physical limitations on building huge, or huge, bigger batteries <laughs> into smartwatches means that our wear watches are going to have to be larger because of things like using LCD and AMOLED screens, which are actually kind of terrible in sunlight. You know what, I'm going to save this because we're going to be talking about Pebble stuff in just a bit. But uh, for what I hope to see moving forward is I hope more wear manufacturers start examining alternative screen technologies. Uh, I think that's really the biggest problem facing watches right now. If you want to watch, it's going to be a little bit smaller. You want to watch, it's going to be a little bit thinner. We have to find a way to eliminate battery. We can't solve this problem by building in larger batteries. Uh, watches don't work that way. Watches are, 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 are a little more personal. They're on your arm. They're worn. So we can't assume that, well, what I'll do is I'll make it more of a bracelet and I'll build a super huge battery in there and it's going to be like this bangle thing that rolls around your wrist. That's not really a great solution. We can't fablet our way out of fixing problems on smartwatches. 
And I think the, the, the main problem is going to be looking at the situation we've got using phone style technology screens. And we can get away from that kind of mess, then I think we'll be in a much better position to build out the next generation of hardware. But I, I would assume that what we'll start seeing are things like uh, um, better Wi-Fi support, uh, definitely better support for things like LTE radios. Uh, I, I, it's it's kind of hard for me to say because I think when it comes to the basics, we're, we've got a pretty good handle on things like notifications. So really, will there be better opportunities for us to engage with services on our phone and through voice actions or through very small screen implementations of apps, that'll be a trickier question, but that's going to come from software. And, and I really don't know that it's going to make that big of a difference when we're looking at you know, like the next generation of Wear Watches. I think the current generation of Wear Watches are going to be able to provide companion support for another year easily before we start to feel like they're completely outclassed. I don't have the same faith in the Apple Watch. I think the next generation Apple Watch will be a marked change over the first one. And uh, I think software support will be a little bit leaner than what Google's trying to accomplish. Uh, and then also, like I said, we'll talk about Pebble. And then Samsung Gear. Samsung could still walk in and deliver something just crazy for Galaxy owners. Uh, so I wouldn't put it past Samsung to, to shake up the market a little bit uh, in being the distant third place smartwatch uh, uh, developer. So uh, we also had a question from... Oh, and that question was courtesy of Austin. Sorry, Austin, thank you for dropping the question. Uh, we asked out a question courtesy of Madged. Are the 2K screens on phones really taken advantage of? If yes, how? Because I just can't tell a difference on my low resolution screen on my S4 and the 2K screen, oh, S4 Zoom, and the 2K screen on my brother's Note 4. Uh, only minor differences. Really looking forward to other SGG QAs. Hey, thanks, Madged. Um, so here's the deal. I get a lot of hate mail because I'm in the camp when we are talking about using phones as phones, when we're having inches of distance or maybe a foot and a half distance between the phone and your face, I don't particularly see a huge difference between a 2K screen, 2560 by 1440, and a 1080p screen at similar screen sizes. We start bumping up to like phablet screen sizes, like I, I think there's a little bit more of a noticeable difference between something like, a, oh it's on the table behind me, a Lumia 1520, which has a 1080p screen, compared to the 5.7 inch screen on the Note 4. I, I, I like There's a textural difference or there's a, a quality to fine detail to small text that I think is a little bit more apparent but it doesn't completely wreck the experience of using the 1080p device. And I think, you know, if you look at people that are rocking the iPhone 6 Plus, I think there are a lot of people out there that would sort of agree with that sentiment. There is a difference. There is a scientific benefit. When I'm walking around outside, when I'm walking around and I'm using my phone and I'm pulling up Facebook or looking at photos on Instagram, there's less of a material advantage for that super pixel-dense screen. It's when you get your nose right into the phone. You're, like, you're looking at it super, super close, which is probably bad for your eyesight, you know, staring into a glowing rectangle. Um, then I think it's a little bit easier to pick them apart. If you hold the two screens right next to each other, you've got them really close. Uh, it's, it's, it's much more apparent that way, but that's, that's atypical usage. We don't really use our phones that way. That's not really how we interact with our devices. And they come with trade-offs. You know, like I, I think 2K screens, even though we've got much more powerful processors, uh, I don't know that they fully balanced out the performance deficit from driving more pixels when you're navigating the UI or playing a game. So the one benefit I will lay, however, on 2K screens is this new emerging wave of using our phones as virtual reality devices, as the screens for VR. And that's where moving up to 2560 by 1440 starts to make a lot more sense. So you've got something like this uh, handy VR viewer from LG and it uses the screen on the G3, which is 2560 by 1440, and it cuts it in half so you get a really high density, high pixel density uh, display for each eyeball. And then, you know, you've got little magnification uh, lenses in there so that you can interact with that screen really well. That makes a lot of sense. You know, the experience of using something like Google Cardboard on a 2K screen is noticeably better than using 1080p because your eyeballs are not only right on top of that screen but you've got lenses which are magnifying the experience. So when you have a less pixel dense display all of that detail gets kind of blurred out in, in lower resolution. 
It's just, you know, you, you're, you're working so much closer. So when you start playing with stuff like that, I think 2K makes a lot of sense. Um, and especially as we start moving forward with things like YouTube 360 support, 360 degree video support, Google Cardboard support, 3D video support, uh, I think consumers are more apt to use their phones as their first virtual reality device. Uh, we still don't have consumer solutions. We don't, still don't have a consumer accessible Oculus Rift. We still don't have Razer solution. We still don't have uh, HTC's Revive. You know, none of these things have actually made it to market. But you can go out right now, spend like ten bucks on you know a pre-assembled Google Cardboard kit or make your own, and have a reasonably good VR experience right now, today, on your phone, the phone you already own. You don't have to buy any other fancy gear. Pop in some headphones. You can really start playing with some cool stuff. And that's one area where maybe having a flagship phone with a, a 2K display is going to make more sense. So I hope that answered your question, Madge. Now moving on, uh, I, I released my full review on the Pebble Time. You can uh, check that out on, on this uh, YouTube channel. It, I'm, I'm super taken with this little watch. It's become one of my favorites. It's definitely going to be a regular in my lineup of smart watches. And uh, I got, a, a, I mean, mostly positive comments on, on this video. Uh, a lot of people coming to talk about different types of lifestyle experiences, which, like I said, I don't think Pebble does a great job with fashion. But when it comes to the experience of, of uh, moving notifications off of your phone, having a screen that you can read in daylight, and not needing to worry about charging your device uh, every other day or every day, uh, Pebble has a formula which is phenomenal for, for actual life. Oh, and waterproofing, that you don't have to worry about taking your phone for a swim. Like, you quickly forget that you even need to worry about, hey, I'm going to be underwater. You know, on a, on a wear watch, the first time you, you get around a pool and like, oh, I'm going to take off my watch and make sure that it's safe and that it doesn't get splashed too much or get soaked. You know, the pebble, you just dive in. You just don't even care anymore. And that's, that, that's an actual lifestyle benefit where you're not babysitting another gadget. This thing's just going to go with you. You don't have to babysit it and charge it. You don't have to babysit it and keep it dry. You don't have to babysit it and, you know, like cover it with your hands so that you can see it out in sunlight. It's just going to go with you. And you just, it, it just becomes ubiquitous. It just blends into the rest of your day. And it's really a, a beautiful experience. Um, so I got a question from Tyndenega. <laughs> I totally wrecked that name. I'm so sorry. Uh, I have to say your review is really tempting me to get this as an entry into the smartwatch experience. I was adamant that I didn't need one, nor was I thrilled with having to struggle to read the screens of other offerings. I'm getting on an age cough, and reading small things is frustrating. So the Pebble is actually the smallest screen on the market. So unfortunately, um, text in fine detail is 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 going to probably be just a little bit more challenging in uh, indoor situations than it might be on something like a slightly larger Android Wear watch or something huge like uh, the Gear S. That's an enormous screen. If you really are worried about that type of reading experience, the Gear S might not be a bad play for you if you're already rocking a Samsung device, that is. Um, it won't play ball with any other Android or the iPhone. Uh, the, again, the Pebble will play cross-platform cross-platform, so that's a little less uh, of a concern. But I am a huge advocate of the smartwatch experience because I think it's another step in the right direction in diversifying what goes on on our phones. Like There are certain things we just take for granted. We will move parts of our phone to other gadgets, things like audio. We totally understand Bluetooth audio, headphones, wired cables, in-car audio, and now we're starting to get really savvy with, I could watch this video from my phone, or I can throw it to my PlayStation, or I can throw it to my Chromecast, I can throw it to some type of TV box. Um, we're getting really good at taking things that used to live just on computing devices and moving them other places. And so I feel... Smartphones actually do a really terrible job with notifications. That's my opinion. A lot of people are going to disagree with me, but it's it's an awful experience in that you have to occupy your sense of vision and kind of your sense of touch to see a bleep or a bloop that happened or a vibration that happened on your phone to then decide if you want to interact with that piece of information. I think that's terribly disruptive to the world around you or to your workflow or to your day or just social situations. I mean, how many times you've been out to dinner and someone just kind of won't put their phone down. You know, they're kind of, it's, it's always like, oh, I'm still listening. I just want to peek, make sure it was, wasn't something important. Just let me look at my phone real quick. Uh, that kind of experience 
t is more of a distraction than when you have your notifications bolted to your wrist. And it's why, like, when, when out in public, I, I'm wearing this out because I was doing some writing before I, I jumped in on this uh, vlog. But uh, normally, I will wear my Pebble on the inside of my wrist, like this real-time demo. This is uh, some pretty hot gadget action right now, let me tell you. So I normally wear my watch on the inside of my wrist just because I'm also paranoid about scraping it up against things when I'm walking around, and it just seems to wear a little bit nicer. I, I think it's a more comfortable fit for me. But then when I'm in the middle of a social situation, and I'm kind of talking and we're having this chat, that was it. Did you just see my eyes flick? My eyes just flicked down to my screen. If I had gotten an alert, that's all the disruption that I would have had to the experience of being in another area with other human beings. Of course, ideally, I'm going to get a bunch of people saying, well, I just always turn my phone completely off. Yeah, that's great. Sometimes we don't have that opportunity. I have a pregnant wife. If she texts me, that's mission critical. I don't, I don't care what I'm doing. I'm going to pick up my phone and answer my wife's text. That's, that's, a, that's a given. That's the relationship I have with my wife. She would do the same for me. She's in a meeting. I text her something important. I know she will get back to me. We have that kind of rapport. So, if I'm getting a ton of alerts because I'm very active on Twitter and Instagram and, and Google Plus and my phone is pretty much always in a constant state of alerting me to something, uh, this becomes the filter where I can say, you know what, that's not a valuable piece of information. I don't need to interrupt what I'm doing right now. And all it took was that glance. That's all it took. So that's why I've become such a big fan of smartwatches. And then the secondary benefits of being able to move things, like when uh, it's less of a distraction when you're trying to operate a motor vehicle. You know, you're not handling a phone. It's just a quick glance down to your wrist. Um, obviously, again, we shouldn't be distracted at all. It can wait um, while driving a car. But the realities of the world we live in, it's us up to us geeks to start retraining other people to consider things like how they interact with their portable electronics while trying to do other things. Because humans, we are terrible at multitasking. Uh, I got another question on the Pebble from Muddy900, and he asks, how is it in the dark? So that is one of the weak areas on the Pebble Time. There's a little backlight that glows when you bring your wrist up and you kind of flick your wrist. You can get it to light up. Also, whenever you hit any of the buttons, a little backlight pops up. But it, it's kind of a washed-out backlight. Excuse me. The, uh, the, the, the advantages of the screen are that it's a complement to your phone. It's not the same as your phone. So your, your phone looks great indoors. Your phone looks amazing at night. Your phone, even, even with the best outdoor viewability modes like Samsung and Nokia devices, your phone doesn't look great in direct sunlight. They can look better, but they don't look great. So what you want, in my opinion, what you should want is a device that... that has some overlap, but can provide you benefits where your phone has weaknesses. If your watch has the same style screen as the screen on your phone, that means they're going to have the same weaknesses. So what's the benefit of strapping a watch to your arm if you're driving in Southern California and the light is coming through your windshield and you can't see your watch? you're still going to have to reach for your phone, you know? Like, you're still going to have to distract yourself from driving if an alert's coming through and you think that it's something that you might need to be aware of and that's really important, you know? So, for me, it's why I've become such a huge fan of Pebble and the Qualcomm Talk is that they fill in the gaps where my phone doesn't perform, and that's namely outdoor viewability and sunlight. Uh, they look okay indoors, and they look okay at night. I can still get information off of them, but it's... It's huge, the difference, when I am outside and all I have to do is look at my wrist, and it's actually better. The screen is better in direct sunlight. You know, that's, that's a phenomenal experience. And so I got uh, two comments of bringing up the Qualcomm Talk, which I have right over here. Um, I got two comments from uh, David Moreno and Sep Sepernuri. I'm so sorry if I just butchered your name. So this was my all-time favorite smartwatch experience. I got spoiled very, very early with the Qualcomm Talk. Uh, this screen is phenomenal in direct sunlight, and I really think they nailed a, a, a really cool combination of locked screen, so that, like nothing happens when you touch it, and then a tap on part of the watch band to get you into a touch screen environment for little applets. I think it's just a great example of the technology side. It's not a very good watch, but it's a great 
wearable technology piece. And I really wish that Qualcomm would come back to this, maybe give us a few more software updates, or uh, develop a Qualcomm Talk 2. Um, I, in, I lovingly call it the tick. So it's the TikTok. <laughs> uh, tech puns, they're great. Um, I, I really wish that Qualcomm would come back to it because I, I think they had something really special here, but it was so new. No one was doing smartwatches. We had our first Samsung gear. Um, it, it was just a little too ahead of the curve. And then maybe utilizing some of this style screen tech with something like Android Wear would give us four-day battery life, five-day battery life, would fix those problems of not being able to see the screen outside in direct sunlight. But until we get that, Pebble has been on board, giving me a lot of those features that I care about. I don't get the touch screen, but I get the amazing outdoor viewability. I get fantastic waterproofing, which to date, I don't think many smartwatches have really accomplished 30 meters of, of waterproofing. And I get insane long uh, battery life. So viewability, durability, uh, battery life, longevity, uh, those things I think are way more important in a watch than whether or not you can play games on it or if you can ask you know do voice actions for turn by turn you know that's all fun stuff that's all the frosting but you want the cake you know the cake's got to be moist and delicious and, and great and so uh, so my pebble time review is out now I uh, I've also just shot I haven't finished editing it but I also just shot my pals at slick wraps have uh, hooked me up with a, uh, a a black faux leather wrap skin for the Pebble Time, and I'm going to be doing a review on that, just kind of assembling it all. It comes with a screen protector. It's a great way because the Pebble is a little plasticky, um, and there's a there's a coating on the front face which is really easy to scratch. Uh, the folks at Slope Graps have a pretty decent solution for kind of protecting and customizing your Pebble watch. So be on the lookout for that video. It should be out early next week. I'm going to be hopefully editing it tonight. So that's Pebble Time. Uh, I'm super stoked with the Pebbles Time, and uh, definitely check out those. Uh, those reviews. I'm just going to move my notes along here. I know this is super exciting streaming video right now. I've got to do a better job of organizing so that I can, I can kind of put this stuff together here. Uh, bum, 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 bum. And I, oh, and just in real time, I do have a question from Justin Lee. Do you answer questions in this comment section? I do, but because I have so many comments and questions, I don't always pull them right away from the comment section. You can also hit the uh, if you're on Google+, Plus, you can hit the Hangouts, uh, the, the, the Hangout link, and uh, there's a QA section, so question, QA uh, questions pri uh, pop up right there. Uh, another QA question, actually speaking of, from Brian Fortney, 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 should I go out and buy my brother who is not, sh oh wait, uh, I just got another one. Should I go out and buy my brother who has not seen the reason for smartwatches at Pebble Time? His birthday is in a few days, and I literally have no idea what to get him because he buys everything he slightly wants. Additionally, because I accidentally hit enter, have you experimented with Windows 10 much on tablets and phones? What is your opinion of it on both platforms? Do you think the mobile version is ready to daily with? Okay. So, tech and watches are very personal items. If you have that kind of relationship with your brother, I'd say go for it. Because it was, I was one of those people who were like, I don't want people buying me tech. I review tech. I buy my own tech. Um, it, it's, it's like, I know what I like, and this is what I... My very first Android Wear watch came from my wife. And she was looking at me talking about other devices, and she saw the Asus Zen watch, and she just naturally said, well, that looks a lot like the watches that he likes to wear, traditional timepieces. I'm going to surprise him with that for Christmas. And I got to say, it was it was a really sweet surprise. Um, because it wasn't she bought me something techy. It was that she really took a second to consider my personal style and the fact that I am into technology. And she landed on something that I never would have probably purchased for myself. Like, I would have been, I would have played it cool. I would have waited until a company sent me a review unit. Uh, it would have been very analytical and scientific about it. And Christmas morning, I open up my Zen watch, and it was a legit surprise, and it was great. So if you have that kind of relationship with your brother and you can kind of play with style and stuff, I don't know that the Pebble's going to win anyone over unless they're already kind of on that vibe. So I have a collection of watches. I have a collection of smart watches. And so I really like things um, that dress up. You know, the, the Asus Zen watch, the LG G watch R, you throw in like a, a really nice uh, leather band. You know, you can do a custom band. I did a review on some amazing hand-stitched leather bands for smart watches. I think that's great. On the, you know, for most days, though, I'm kind of a, a jeans and T-shirt kind of dude. And this sort of swatch watch style, 
fits in perfect with a comfy pair of kicks and you know like my little flat cap and that's that's totally something that I can dig on too. So Pebble if he's got kind of a comfier vibe, if he's got kind of a comfier style, he likes, you know, like old uh, old Converse tennis shoes or, you know, novelty t-shirts, that'll fit right in. If he's more a dress-up kind of guy, I don't know that he's going to like it anyway. I mean, regardless of whether or not he thinks the technology is amazing, he's just not going to wear it because it's it's kind of swatch-watchy. So that, that, that's how I would handle that. As for Windows 10, I have played with it on uh, laptops, hybrids, I haven't played with it on anything like Atom Powered, um, any of the little mini Windows tablets, and I have it loaded on my Lumia 1520. I don't like doing full-on tours and video reviews on things like beta software um, because I think we get so much content produced like that, and then people get it locked in their brains that it's buggy or that it's incomplete, so that even when the finished product comes out, there's a perception of it not being ready for prime time, even though it kind of is. So I get a little sensitive to how I present products that I think are ready for consumers. That That's really my main focus. I don't like to talk about rumors. I don't like to talk about leaks. I don't like to talk about beta. Um, I like to experience those things. <laughs> I like to play with those things. But I don't like to produce content on those things because I really want people who find my channel to have a really clear understanding of this was a product that a company said was ready for prime time and we think it is and we think it's great or this is a product that a company said was really ready for prime time and we think it's got some bugs you know that's that's how I wanna focus on the discussion here but if you're willing to put up with some instability I, I, I think uh, Windows 10 has been running great on my 1520 um, I haven't had any major complaints. Uh, you you have to know that it's going to be less stable, and you have to know that there are going to be some wonky bugs. I, I get apps that close kind of randomly in places that I didn't have on Windows 8. Um, but the experience is cool. I mean, I think it's really cool. It, it's a little trickier when we start talking about computers, tablets, full computers, because if it's a if, if it's your mission critical workstation, leave it alone. Stay with what you're using right now. Wait until it's fully out in the ecosystem, and then do your upgrade then. But if you've got like a like a beater laptop just kind of lying around, and you want to play with it. Windows 10 is great. I'm I'm having a blast with it. I think a lot of people are are going to come to it because it merges my some of my favorite things about Windows 10 with uh, an environment that very much resembles all the stuff that we like about Windows 7. And uh, I think that's going to be a pretty solid combo for a lot of people out there. So uh, I, I can't outright answer your question, but that's kind of where I'm coming from. So uh, moving right along, Footloose and Fancy Free. Uh, the biggest video that I put out this week, I actually dropped yesterday, and I kind of put it out there as not a joke, but as sort of a throwaway. I didn't really expect that it would get a lot of traction. And so what I did... Remember early on, I was talking about certain things where um, I, I've been very critical of the Galaxy S6. I, I, I can't say that I, I, I've been very lukewarm on the Galaxy S6. Samsung is my favorite Android manufacturer. Uh, I, I think they do an amazing job when they build their phones with a focus. So when their phone targets a demographic, I think their work is unparalleled. That's where we got phones like the Note. And I don't know that a, that a more beautiful, corporate, professional, productivity-focused device has been built better than the Note 4. <clears throat> the flip side of that is, I think they're also one of the only mainstream companies that are still focused on building out more rugged devices. Um, not like Kyocera. Like Kyocera, everything they do is sort of waterproofed and rugged and mid-range and a little less expensive. They're focused more on budget crowd, stuff like that. Uh, but when you start playing with phones like the Active, the Galaxy Actives, I think they're better than the regular S series phone. I'm less interested in Samsung when they're making an all-rounder. I, I, I'm not interested in the Galaxy S versus iPhone 6 fight. Those are the most generic devices on the market. They're, they're, they're sort of the lowest common denominator devices and trying to reach the broadest cross-section of people. And I, I don't know that they're always the best tools for people. They're just the easiest tools for people to find. But if people, if consumers spend a little time saying, you know, like, I really need this feature and I'm willing to live with this compromise and I want to focus on this experience, then I could pick the perfect phone for me. But I think most people are just sort of generally comfortable with the phone that's good enough. And unfortunately, that's kind of where I see phones like the iPhone 6 and the Galaxy S, S line of phones landing. Uh, they're just generally very good 
at almost everything, and that's fine. But I want phones that are sort of focused in on specific features and give us those capabilities. That was a really long explanation. So uh, I did, because uh, because the, the thing I've been most critical with Samsung about with the Galaxy S6, and this is something that I actually start to think is a bit of a detriment, is the combination of Android 5.0, because most Galaxy S6s still haven't been updated to 5.1, uh, the TouchWiz software overlay, and the kernel and memory management features on the Galaxy S6 work with, you know, work in tandem to create an experience which feels like the most powerful smartphone in the world struggles to do things like open apps and multitask. Uh, when you pick up a Galaxy S6, it is radically aggressive at booting apps out of memory. It just kicks them right out of RAM. Uh, and so then when you go back to reopen an app, it basically is opening that app from scratch. You notice this most with games. So if you've got a game, like I've been addicted to Marvel Future Fight, when you fire it up on uh, Samsung, if you've opened any other app since opening the game, you have to open up the game from scratch. It just it almost immediately ejects the game from RAM. And it feels really laggy. That feels really stuttery, especially when you compare it to... Uh, a 10-month-old phone like the Moto X 2014. <laughs> Hello, Moto. There it is again. That's awesome. So uh, this phone is about, all about streamlining the Android experience. It's, there's, there's almost no sort of custom overlay. It's a very close to stock, close to Nexus experience. And uh, I have to say, I don't know that I've found any phone in the Android ecosystem which runs as smooth after the number of updates and patches that this phone has received. We have sort of a, just a general understanding that phones will sort of slow down over time, like software gets more aggressive, updates get a little bit bigger, manufacturers pack on more features and more bloat, and that hasn't been my experience on the Moto X. The Moto X has actually remained pretty true to its original mission of just being as lean and as quick and as snappy as possible. So... Uh, being the nerd that I am, and I'm not a big fan of benchmarking. I don't like benchmark videos. I think they're boring and dumb. <laughs> but I took my Galaxy S6 and I took my Moto X and I ran them through a multitasking speed test. Uh, I took six apps, uh, four social media apps, two games, and I went through two passes where I would open the app, then go home, open the app, then go home, open the app, then go home for all six apps, and then would go automatically right back in again, expecting that those apps would still be in RAM. We're not we're talking about like a dozen apps. A, a modern day smartphone with two gigabytes or more of RAM should be able to hold six apps in RAM, especially six apps that you have said, I am using these apps that you can go back and forth. So uh, what I was really expecting to have happen, and I was very surprised by the results, what I was expecting to have happen was the Galaxy S6 would blow through the first round and then the Moto X would catch up or maybe even beat it on the second round. Because I really think Samsung has a, 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 not a problem, but an issue with how it handles RAM. I was very surprised to see that the combination of leaner interface, more streamlined software, and lower resolution screen, we do have to give that nod to the Moto X because it only uses a 1080p display, landed such an insane victory over the Galaxy S6. And it was like no contest that not only did it launch every app faster the first round, it then blew through the apps launching up on the second round. To the tune of those six apps took about a minute and 10 seconds to launch twice, each app twice, on the Moto X. It took almost two minutes to launch on the Galaxy S6. So this obviously has, has angered a number of people who are fans of Samsung. And I got to say, guys, uh, it's, it's getting a little less fun to talk about Samsung stuff because the Samsung fanboys are getting viscerally obnoxious. Uh, that There's nothing Samsung can do wrong, and any criticism of, Sam of Samsung means you're wrong, not that Samsung has a problem. And if, if a Samsung phone ever loses a test or a comparison or a benchmark, uh, it's because you did it wrong or you're a shill or you were paid off by another company to fudge the results or you're faking it just to besmirch the good name of Samsung. 
I got one. This is from Big Boss Gaming. Uh, this video is null and void. Null and void. Because you didn't do them side by side and testing apps at the same time and did things at separate times. You have proved nothing. And you're like, can we get over the drama? I, this is a totally replicatable test. You can actually find people doing very similar things with the Galaxy S6. And you can go to XDA developers right now and you will find tons of threads from the smartest uh, developers in the Android ecosystem, people hacking up their own ROMs and hacking up their own their own kernels and digging into the nitty gritty, finding ways to improve the situation on every single Android phone out there. This is not a secret. This is not a unique experience. I just have one bum Galaxy S6. Oh, my Galaxy S6 is broken. This is a very replicatable issue that Samsung has with memory management, and it makes us cranky because we have the most powerful smartphone on the market in the Galaxy S6, and it struggles to compete with your old hardware, which is better optimized in terms of hardware and software. And that's always going to be the winner. This is the focus for Microsoft, it's the focus for Apple, and it was the focus for Motorola. It provides for a better experience. Um, so, and, and the other thing that I really want to express is, this is a very specific test in terms of multitasking capabilities. It's not to be designed to influence your purchasing decision. If the Galaxy S6 is still the best tool for you, just because I don't necessarily love it, that doesn't mean you shouldn't go out and buy that phone. Using gadget bloggers to help you make purchasing decisions is kind of not a great idea when you think about it because we get a ton of stuff to play with and our perception of what's a pro and a con is very different usage than someone who just needs a solid, stable, well-built piece of gadgetry so that they can interact with the services that they care most about. And I have nothing to do with how I use my phone. And so uh, Pions24 asks, is the, is the GS6 still worth getting even with this issue? First of all, you know I get cranky about the word worth. Is it worth it? Is it worth it for the monies? Should I buy it? I think when gadget bloggers start asking those questions in a way that leads the discussion, that's super toxic. That is horrible to the discussion of gadgetry. It's not my job to tell you if something's worth it. Thumbs up, thumbs down, buy, don't buy. That's bullshit. Um, but what I can do is help ask, answer specific questions about devices. You know, like, we can get into, I can, I can have, like, a two-hour discussion right now about the camera differences between the LG G4 and the Galaxy S6. I'm happy to do that. I'm stoked to do that. I want to talk about nuance, and I want to talk about, you know, usage scenarios and different conditions and, and how these things really play against each other, not, should I buy a G4 or a Galaxy S6? I can't answer that question. It's so broad. I can't. I, I, in good conscience, there's no way for me to have an intelligent discussion answering that question um, without it just being my personal preference, which doesn't really help you make a purchasing decision. So Galaxy S6 still worth getting? Of course it is. It absolutely is. iPhone 6 is still worth buying. A Note 4 is still worth buying. You need to sit down and look at what are the features I care most about and what are the compromises I'm willing to live with. So, you know, if you're willing to live with a slightly smaller battery and a more powerful phone in a super thin build that has glass on the back, but you really want that baller camera and that AMOLED screen, you have to deal with the compromises of some of the build and the thinness and the smaller battery weighed against one of the most amazing cameras on a mobile device today and a fantastic screen with great outdoor view viewability for a smartphone. You can make that decision. You can make your list of pros and cons and totally answer those questions for yourself. You don't need us to sit there and throw our bias BS down your throat. You know, just vomit it out like bile. And say, oh, my personal favorite is the LG G4 and everyone should buy that phone. That's crap. I know tons of people in my circle of friends who should not own the LG G4. That's easy. But you can also come to me and have discussions like, should you be looking at a Galaxy S6 or should you be looking at a Galaxy S6 Active? Because I'm a big fan of the Galaxy S6 Active. I think this is a killer phone, even though it still has some of the same issues that the regular Galaxy S6 has. So we want to have a more nuanced discussion. We can't keep falling for this fanboy brigade because they're out there like, like Tumblr people just pooping all over YouTube videos to, to preach the truth about how everyone is a shill if they don't like Samsung. And it's no fun. LG people don't do that. Windows phone people 
don't do that. Uh, Motorola people, uh, Motorola people are just happy if anyone's ever to ask talking about Motorola. Motorola people and me, we're getting along really well right now. So, uh, but case in point, and I want to throw a shout out. Uh, if you're watching this video and you care about things like speed runs and tests and benchmarks, and you don't believe me that the Galaxy S6 has sort of a compromised memory uh, management system. Uh, one of the people who commented on my speed run goes by the, the YouTube handle Inner Ear Thing. I'm going to leave a link to this to his video uh, under the description in this video. Inner Ear Thing went to XDA developers and he looked up some of the patches that they've been working on for memory management on the Galaxy S6 and he applied one of those patches. And we see in his test, he did the exact same apps that I did in my test. Now, obviously, he doesn't have everything that my phone has on it. So it's not a scientific test. All of this is anecdotal, but we have enough anecdotal evidence to see a general trend. But he went through the exact same apps that I had set up on my phone, and he beat the Moto X with the Galaxy S6 using this memory management patch. We have clear indication that Samsung's kernel, there's something wonky going on there. This is not, uh, I think Samsung is awful and they're screwing customers. Um, but we can't sit back and not criticize when we think there's an actual issue. And we've got to celebrate when people are actively going out there to do things about it. So the folks at XDA, they're doing some amazing work in cleaning up some of the problems that I think Samsung is probably playing their kernel way too aggressive in memory management because they're afraid of battery management. You know, like you put in a smaller battery in a more powerful phone, you're probably going to be more aggressive with how you let services run in the background. I think that makes sense, but I think it was the wrong way to do a battery saver technology on the Galaxy S6 because it makes the phone look like it's struggling. It makes the phone look like it's underperforming. So check out Inner Ear Thing. He's got a great... He, he, I mean, first of all, look at my speed run so you can see the Moto X versus the Galaxy S6 stock. Um, you know, no uh, augmentation or adaptation or n nothing rooted, no, no different ROMs. Just two phones that are used very similarly with, you know, similar storage used up. They're both 32 gig phones with no expandable storage. And I have the same apps installed on both. I've been using both in very similar ways. Uh, both of them actually have the same music collection uh, pre-downloaded on them. I mean, like, they're as close to uh, simpatico as you can make them. Um, go Look at what I've done with those two, and then check out Inner Ear Things video, because you'll see what the Galaxy S6 is really capable of if we could get some better software refinement. And that's enough me uh, bitching <laughs> about memory and RAM and crap like that. So, uh, we should really kind of wrap this up. So last week, um, I, I had a call to action. And uh, the, the call to action was uh, a question about Periscope. And uh, I, I toy, when I did my Pebble Time, before I did my Pebble Time review, I did an unboxing. I hate doing, like producing an unboxing video for YouTube. I think unboxing videos are awful and boring and... I don't know, kind of masturbatory. I, I don't know. Like, they're not fun. I, I don't enjoy the act of taking something out of a box, especially when it's not people who are excited to take something out of a box. It's someone who's, like, obligated. You know what I mean? Like, if you gave a little kid an amazing toy and you videotaped them taking it out of the box, that's maybe the only viable unboxing situation, in my opinion. But I do actually have to take these things out of boxes to use them, so I was toying around with Periscope being a way that I could interact with people live, maybe take a couple questions, kind of go through the setup process as I'm experiencing it in real time. And uh, that could be kind of a fun way. So you can save Periscope videos, but they're terrible, it's super low quality. And so most people who answered the call to action, the question was, should I continue using Periscope? And should I continue trying to upload those videos to YouTube after I'm done with them? And uh, most people... Uh, Almost everybody said, don't upload them to YouTube. It's really not worth cataloging these videos. They're totally disposable, and it's not really content that we're going to sit down and, like, like check out years from now. So I totally respect that, and, and I'll probably... I, I'd set up, like, a, a potential playlist. I think I'm just going to delete it, and, and I might even just get rid of my Pebble Time unboxing just because it's not... It's also a different experience because I'm actively talking to people who are leaving comments on Periscope, but you can't see the comments 
on the saved video. So again, it's it's just not a great overall experience. But I, people were sort of torn half and half as to whether or not I should con continue doing Periscope. So I'm going to keep playing with Periscope. I'm probably going to reserve it more for live events. Um, there's a Cyclavia event going on in Santa Monica in a, in a couple weeks, and so I'll probably go down there and cover some stuff on Periscope. Uh, I, I'm looking at, there's a gadget, a gadget blogger meetup at Disneyland in about a month, and so I'll probably be doing some stuff on the Periscopes then. So uh, I've got some, there, there are going to be some opportunities, some, some things to have fun with uh, coming down the pipe, but I'm probably not going to put a ton of effort into creating content for Periscope like you know, set, sitting down and doing formal unboxings and Q&As and stuff like that. I'm going to save that more for, for the YouTubes. But uh, we did have a contest based on that call to, call to uh, CTA, that's call to action, uh, question. And uh, the contest was for this Lugu Lake speaker doc. And so you could have either shared the video using the, uh, the hashtag SGGQA, or you could uh, answer the call to action question in the comments. And the winner of the, uh, the Periscope CTA question is Alex Toma. Alex Toma, I will be sending you a private message after this video is uploaded and rendered to the YouTubes uh, so that I can get your details to ship out your Lugu Lake tablet speaker doc. This is super cool speaker. I had a lot of fun with it, and I think you will enjoy it as well. So uh, thank you, everybody who participated. Thank you so much for all the people who shared uh, videos and talked about stuff. Um, this is just sort of a fun one for me just to kind of start off a little teaser, whet the appetite, because, again, coming up in August, we've got a ton of stuff to give away, and I really need folks out there talking about all the cool things that we're going to be doing on this channel. So uh, just do one quick pass, see if I've got any more comments. I think I hit everything in the Q&A. Uh, got... Oh, I, I do have a question from uh, Miguel B. Uh, let's see. Uh, have you read the leak specs of the upcoming Lumia City Man and Lumia Talk Man? What do you think about them? So uh, we've, we've been getting a lot of that conflicting messaging on what Microsoft is going to be doing with the next generation of Windows Phone flagships. Uh, we had a pretty clear indication of what what their strategy was going to be after Nadella wrote that memo, making tough choices and then talking about uh, streamlining their phone production, only focusing on like three tiers of phone as opposed to the, the four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, thirteen, and fifteen hundred series phones. I mean, there was almost ten lines of phones that all had weird overlaps, and it was a very confusing marketplace. So I'm I'm really stoked if they can focus on sort of uh, an entry-level mid-range flagship or an entry-level flagship and camera phone. If they brought back the 1040, I would be way happier about that than if they did like a mid-ranger instead because I think mid-range phones are, I don't know. Anyway, we can talk about that later. So uh, City Man and Talk Man, uh, they're looking at Qualcomm 808, Qualcomm 810s. That makes me a little nervous. Um, the 810 isn't a bad processor. It just runs hot and it throttles. So... For short interactions, if you're a person who uses their phone in very brief spurts, it's fine. The 810 is actually a fine performer. It's just when you start getting into longer periods of usage. Turn-by-turn -turn navigation, I think, is a great example of, you know, your phone is using its data connection, it's running down the battery, the screen is on, and it's constantly pulling information. Uh, performance starts to suffer in situations like that. So if you try and multitask, like jump out of turn-by-turn um, -turn to get to your music app and then go back into turn-by-turn, -turn, the phone is painfully laggy and stuttery in situations like that. So I hope that Qualcomm has addressed some of those issues if they are going to use the 810 in the phablet, the larger, the 940 or 950XL. Um, the 808's been great. Uh, and the G4, even with the 2K screen shooting UHD video, doing fast photo bursts, uh, I interacting with uh, 2K and 4K video, playing games, it's been fine. It's been great. So the 808 on a, on a 2560 by 1440 screen using the Windows OS, which the Windows Phone OS is a little bit leaner than Android, I think is going to be fine. Uh, really, what's most concerning to me is Microsoft's timing and strategy. So if we get the 940, I would assume that we will get that closer to the actual launch of Windows 10. Um, if they're looking at jumping to the 950, the rumors are pointing to a release in November. 
we've gone so long in Windows Phone Land without a new flagship that people are fatigued. We're kind of tired of always turning to the 930 and the 1520. We kind of need some new hardware. We need something to get excited about. And I think we need that closer to dads and grads time. You know, wait, is that right? No. We need that closer to back to school time. God, I'm so tired. We need that closer to back to school. You know, people are making purchasing decisions. Once we get through the summer, we're going to have the Note 5 and new iPhones, probably a new Motorola. If we wait until, like, the week before Christmas to release a device, most of those things have already been purchased. Microsoft is a surefire guarantee to not make any, build any momentum if it's too late in the year because people will have already bought other things. Uh, that money will already have been spoken for. But if we can get it maybe a little closer to fall, out of the summer, into back-to-school season, I think you, you, ain't, you, you have the potential to make a lot more noise, get a lot more people on board trying out something like a Windows phone, especially with the release of Windows 10. You know, the Windows 10 is going to be all over tablets. It's going to be all over desktops and laptops. I think it's going to be a positive step in the right direction. People will act like Windows 8 was some kind of Vista, and Windows 10 is going to be more like Windows 7, and everyone's going to have way more confidence in it. And I, I think if you can piggyback on that sentiment, Windows Phone stands a better chance of building a little bit more momentum. But really, the whole ecosystem is just, just feels like it's been so stagnant. Anything we can do to shake it up. Um, if we can build a, a, a flagship towards the end of this year and then build out a new camera phone at the beginning of next year, have that primed for CES, that would be phenomenal. That's, that's really what my hope is. So, uh, Miguel, that's kind of my thoughts on it. I, I think the hardware looks like it's on point. We just need it. We need it in our hands now. We're tired of waiting for... We're tired of them moving the goalposts. Well, we'll give you a new version of Windows when this happens. But we'll give you a new phone when we get the new version of Windows. And it's just exhausting. It's tiring. So uh, this week's CTA, I'm going to take it back. It's National Tell Me a Joke Day. Drop me, uh, drop me a joke in the comments. I got one joke from, uh, <laughs> from Terminathan. I, I don't know how you say, say his name. That's terrible. Um, Terminathan's joke is, who farted across the road? A butt. So that's not really a joke. Uh, I'm sure all of you can do better than Terminathan, <laughs> so tell me a joke. And like I said, if uh, if I find something cool, something you know just wacky to give away, maybe I've, I you know I think I've got like a Kingston flash drive. How about this? The the joke that makes me laugh the best in the comments down below this video, I'll send you a Kingston flash drive. It's a little I think it's like a 32 gig USB flash drive. We'll do that. I think I've got one of those on hand. So, folks, uh, this is uh, wrapping up another SGGQA. Thank you so much for all the people that are dropping me comments on these videos, the people that are participating live, that, you know, I've got viewers that are watching live in real time. It's super exciting for me, building up this channel, doing a little more podcasty style stuff. Uh, it's, it's always kind of a head trip when you just start talking because there's no one else here. I'm just looking at a camera, having a conversation with the Internet. So, folks, uh, as always, thanks so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe for more videos and reviews and comparisons and tutorials and uh, vlogs and podcasts. And uh, I wouldn't be able to continue producing on this channel without support from you guys, uh, for, from the people that are hitting my fan funding links on videos. Uh, that kind of support is so greatly appreciated. For the people that are out there shopping on my Amazon affiliate links, again, that's helping us keep the lights on here at Some Gadget Guy. You can also support by hooking up Loot Crate. If you're a fan of the Loot Crate, I have a promo code that'll save you 10% on a Loot Crate, and that also helps support this channel. So uh, you get yourself some really cool geek and gamer gear. You're also supporting this channel. And then lastly, just all of you folks out there that are dropping comments and sharing my videos. So every time you share a video on a social site like Facebook or Twitter or Reddit or Google Plus or Vote or LinkedIn or wherever you like to, to hang out online, uh, you're bringing more cool people to the party. It helps us expand this conversation. It helps keep my numbers up, and it means that I can do things like do really cool giveaways uh, so that we can give away brand spanking new smartphones and speaker docks and VR viewers and awesome iPhone camera cases. So I can't thank you enough, but I can't continue doing it if you guys aren't out there supporting supporting the channel, and it's, it's all greatly appreciated. So uh, hit that thumbs up button, and I will catch you all on the next video.